be seated. That's beautiful. I invite you to turn the Word of God to Luke 23, the Gospel of Luke in the 23rd chapter. Some portions of the Word of God where there is a strange kind of reluctance to endeavor to preach what is revealed. I certainly feel that in a, in a sense, not that I don't want to preach it, but just a, a realization that there are mysteries contained in what we read because of the, the intensity of the occasion and its significance, it sometimes can produce this feeling of, I can't do it justice. Maybe it's best if I don't preach it at all. But as we have gone through Luke's gospel, we have arrived at the scene of the cross and last Lord's Day, we endeavored to look at the first three hours of the cross. And we can see that because you pull all lines together. You can, you know, roughly about the time that the Lord was crucified. Verse 44 tells us that at noon, the sixth hour, there is something that occurs here. And then we know also that our Lord died around the ninth hour. And so we have six hours in terms of the crucifixion, the period of our Lord being on the cross. And we looked, as I said, uh, last Lord's Day at the first three hours revealed by Luke. From verse 32 through verse 43. So now we come to verse 44. I'm going to look through verse 49. And so I'll just read those verses with you tonight. Luke 23, verse 44. This is what the Spirit inspired Luke to write, to record for us. Luke 23, 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. We end our reading of God's word at verse 49. What you have heard again is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. You are to receive it and believe it as such. And the people of God said, Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that thou wilt teach us more and more to value that old rugged cross. Oh, that we would love not just the historical event but the theological occurrence, the redemptive act, the substitutionary atonement, the reality of our sins being laid on the Son of God, the one being who was 
holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, being made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He is all our hope. Lord, we pray now that thou wilt look in pity upon us. Make us to be conscious of our frailty and feebleness, but also to be conscious of thy power, thy strength made perfect in weakness. Holy Ghost, come upon us. Help us now in the ministry of the word and extend thy kingdom by feeding thy sheep and lambs and saving the lost. Oh, let the preaching of the cross be the power of God unto salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In John 12, as our Lord Jesus approached Jerusalem, very conscious of what was right in front of him, he declared to the crowd, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He then went on to say, for this cause came I unto this hour. came to this hour, an hour illustrated in the fashion as recorded in John 12, as a corn of wheat falling into the ground. The corn of wheat can't produce fruit, can't be productive, can't do what is its purpose unless it falls into the ground and of itself, as it were, dies. If it dies, it brings forth fruit. If it dies, it fulfills its purpose. Herein our Lord describes for us what he was here to do. Not merely to traverse the earth, not merely to enter into the experiences of humanity, not merely to be an example, not merely to give and impart wisdom, but to die the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. For this hour, for this purpose, he has come, the hour has arrived. The Old Testament tells the story in this way. And I will weave together for you pure quotations from the Old Testament scriptures. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. They give me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst they give me vinegar to drink. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. 
he hath put him to grief. But thou shalt make a soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he sh shall bear their iniquities. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. That's the cross. The Holy Spirit, centuries before the event, gives such a scene, such details, in fact, they give us more of an understanding in terms of some of the horrors of what our Lord was doing and all that's involved than even the record of the Gospels themselves. And having considered the first three hours last Lord's Day, we come this evening then to the final three hours of the cross. The final three hours of the cross in verses 44 through 49. I have five heads I had seven last week, so in total this is 12, if you're adding them all up. Not intentional, but again, these are just observations that I've made in musing over these verses. And I trust once again that as we look at this, the Lord will bless our time and teach our hearts things of profound meaning and significance. First, in these final three hours of the cross, note the transition. The transition. Verses 44 and 45. And in the transition noted here, first of all, there is a transition from type to fulfillment. A tr transition from type to fulfillment. Verse 44, and it was about the sixth hour, it's noon, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened. Around noon, we are told, midday, when the sun is at its highest, a strange darkness comes over Calvary and lasts for three hours. How God brought this darkness, we are not told. We're not told it was an eclipse. We're not told whether it was heavy clouds that came over the sky. We're not told any of that. But it would appear in a natural reading that something supernatural for sure is going on. We're not told either of the extent of it. The language used is that it came over all the earth, but the word earth can also be translated land. It came over all the land. So was it restricted to Israel? Or was it across the entire world? Again, detail is not made plain. But it's not material. What is material is why. Why did God perform the supernatural sign? Why? When the sun was at its highest, did the world go dark around the cross? We must remember the significance of what darkness or the contrast, light, is what's taught in the Word of God concerning these things. For example, we're told in 1 John 1 that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. We're told our Lord Jesus is the light of the world, John 8, 12. We are told in Revelation 21 of the city where there is no need of the sun nor the moon for the glory of God lightens it and the Lamb is the light thereof. In contrast, when God brought judgment upon the Egyptians in his deliverance of the children of Israel, he brought darkness over the Egyptians, a darkness that could be felt. It was part of the judgment. When our Lord Jesus spoke of judgment upon the unbelieving, he said in Matthew 8, 12, that they shall be cast into outer darkness. And he taught the same thing again in Matthew 22, 13 and Matthew 25, 30. Peter, in addition, wrote of angels that sinned and they were cast down to hell and delivered into chains of darkness. And I could go on. Darkness is a description of judgment. Darkness is not good. And so it's not a stretch to see this scene as indicating a form of judgment. Some kind of judgment is being displayed here by God. And I am in agreement with the vast majority of Orthodox teachers who understand that this judgment 
This darkness is a reflection of the judgment that is coming upon the Son of God as He has made sin for us. As our sins are laid upon Him, as the judgment that we deserve for our sin, He stands in that place. He is enduring now not merely the torture of the Romans, but the judgment of God. And as we read in Isaiah 53, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. He has been set aside. He has been appointed to be put to grief, to suffer. And thus, this darkness then is a sign of transition from tight to fulfillment. Throughout the Old Testament scriptures, over and over and over again, there are distinct types and prophecies given, and central to them all is the message of judgment being laid upon another. Go right back to the beginning. Go right back to when Adam and Eve, in their fear of God, sought to sew together their, the fig leaves and cover themselves, and God instead kills an animal and clothes them with the skin of the animal, showing again a sense or an implication of substitution, of judgment upon an animal. The animal didn't commit the sin, but it dies in the place to cover Adam and Eve. Consider the same when Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22 are making their way to Mount Moriah. And Isaac knows, and he is looking around, where's the lamb? Abraham's response is, God will provide the lamb. And as you move through, you come into, of course, Exodus. You have the Passover in which an animal is killed, indicating again a sense of substitution, judgment being laid on the creature. You have the children of Israel delivered then, coming into their own as a nation and being appointed various sacrifices in the Levitical form of worship. Each one of those sacrifices, in large part, indicating again a sense of judgment upon another that those who should be judged go free. But it requires this one to die in the place of them. Here we have then judgment coming upon the Messiah himself, indicated by the world going dark. Oh, we can't see the innermost part of a soul. We can't begin to comprehend all of the agony and all that's involved. But we know this. We know he's being made sin for us. We know he's standing in our place. We know that it's by his stripes we're healed. That there's this redemptive act in which judgment is laid on the son that the guilty who believe in him might go free. It is then a transition from type to fulfillment. All those types, all that was going on in the past, all that was happening even in the occasion of Passover right there at that time, all of it was pointing to an expectation that God will provide himself a lamb, God will bring one upon whom the judgment will fall so that the sinner can go free who believes in the Lord Jesus. So the world goes dark to signify this awful moment. Sacrifice is awful. It wasn't a delight. I don't know if you've ever pondered and thought about and considered all the sacrifices and the smell and this, what was being signified. And it's not pleasant. There's nothing delightful about it. But here we have the transition. Because all those sacrifices, all that had been indicated from Genesis onward was pointing to someone who was going to come and put an end to this. And here it is. And the world goes dark to signify the significance of what is going on. It's also a transition from old to new. Not just from tight to fulfillment, but from old to new. In verse 45, it says also, that the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. The other remarkable event, miraculous sign, 
that Luke records, and there are others as well, but we're sticking with Luke and what he records for us, is the, the renting of the temple veil. Again, if you remember the tabernacle in which there was this, the tabernacle proper, the court around it, and the tabernacle proper where you would go in, and it was divided. And the far room, the holiest of all, only the high priest could enter there, and he could only enter there once a year on the Day of Atonement. When the temple was built, the same thing was signified. And again, there was this far room in which only the high priest could enter, and it was separated, it was divided by this veil. And this veil is not something that would fall apart easily. And if we could understand the construction of the veil, we'll realize here that when this is torn, when this is rent, and another gospel account tells us explicitly that it was torn from top to bottom as an indication that this was not performed by the hand of man, but by the hand of God. Heaven comes down to tear the veil in two. And it signifies transition. Transition from old to new. From the old covenant to the new covenant. From the old way to the new and living way. From a time in which everything was done in order to fulfill types and, and shadows and ceremonies to a new way in which all trust and hope is placed upon the fulfilled work of our Lord Jesus Christ, in which we see that all the blood of bulls and goats that could never take away sin, now the shedding of the blood of God's Son puts away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanseth us from all sin, 1 John 1. And so there is this transition from old to new, the separating of the veil, indicating that the way to God now has been opened. It's not that people could not worship. It's not that people could not pray before, but they were, they were waiting. They were waiting for the inauguration of full and free access to God. And so even as they prayed, they prayed in the hope of what the Messiah would do. They looked forward to what he would accomplish, never trusting the sacrifices, never believing they could put away sin, always understanding they signify God's promised Messiah and Redeemer. And now having come, having fulfilled the work, having done the Father's will, having laid down his life, now the veil is rent. The way is open. Sinners can be assured that Jesus is enough. The way to God is now open. The veil is torn. And we move from the old covenant era into the new. Hebrews 10 declares that we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And the sense is by faith we come right into the presence of God by faith through this new and living way. We no longer need a priestly mediator in terms of the Levitical priests. We have one in Jesus Christ, the great high priest, who has accomplished the work and not only, not only brings himself into the presence of God, but by the rending of the veil brings all those who are in union with him into the presence of God as well. That's what we've been seeing in, Levitic, in uh, Hebrews, isn't it? So transition, that's the first thing. There is secondly here the completion not only the transition, but the completion. Verse 46. When Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Luke does not include all the cries or sayings of our Lord Jesus on the cross. But he includes a number of them. He does, however, leave out the one that comes before this. It is finished, revealed by John. But he gives the final words, he gives the last words of our Lord Jesus recorded for us. These words here in verse 46. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now you may read that and think it's not as significant as it is finished. And I will grant you that the language, it is finished, is packed with theological significance. But don't underestimate the significance of these words either. 
Luke focuses on the final words that show to us a tremendous sense of confidence that the Lord Jesus possessed himself in what is going on, what had happened and what is yet to occur. The language, into thy hands I command my spirit, is a direct quotation from Psalm 31 verse 5. It is a prayer of the believer. It is a prayer of one who rests in God, one who believes that they can entrust their soul to God, one who knows and is confident that they're accepted and is assured that they will not be turned away. In other words, in contrast with the cry of dereliction, the my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is now come then to a position now of confidence and rest. But the Son of God knows that what the Father appointed for him to do is all being fulfilled, and he can be at rest with what, as I say, has been done and is yet to come to pass. So he uses believing words, underlining his confidence, his understanding of the satisfactory nature of his work. But he prefixes it with the designation of God as Father, again, which is not insignificant. It demonstrates his trust. It shows his perfect faith, his understanding of acceptance before the Father, knowing that he's fulfilled as well, knowing that he's been obedient in every jot and tittle. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. This is not the language of one in distress as they are about to die. This is the language of confidence. I'm committing myself to you, Father. I trust you. And I give this whole matter of my death into your hands. One of the remarkable things of our Lord's death relates to the various details when pulled together to indicate the voluntary nature of his death. What I mean is that he did not expire at the ninth hour because he could no longer live. He expired at the ninth hour because the work was done. And he, as has often been said, stepped into death. In John 10, he uses language that he had power to lay down his life and power to take it again. That no man taketh it from me, I have power to lay it down of myself. Even some of the language that's used in the Gospels in relation to his dying, and certainly even the last statement here, commending his spirit into the hand of the Father, not only that, but the way in which he says it. Look at what detail is given to us. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice. Now, if you have been around death, you will know in most instances there is no strength to cry with a loud voice. Are there forms of death in which that may happen, occur? Certainly, very violent deaths in which the death happens very quickly. There may be a certain amount of strength in the body to cry out loudly, but with protracted deaths that exhaust the body, such as our Lord has endured, by the time someone comes to the end of crucifixion, they have no strength. The whole thing is utterly exhausting. It takes effort even for the crucified to breathe. They've been using the last ounces of their energy to push themselves up so they can get air into their lungs. And so when they come to the point of death, there is no more strength. They can no longer push themselves off or up. And so often their death is actually caused by the inability to take in another breath. But this is not so with our Lord. He has strength sufficient to push up, take a full breath in his lungs and cry with a loud voice. 
If you were to observe such and you were experienced in crucifixion and you'd watched others die in this way, you would be thinking to yourself, he has a long time yet to go. There's a considerable period of time yet before this man will expire. But not so for the Lord. His cry with a loud voice is a public testimony to, that this is no ordinary death. It's a public testimony that he is not just fading away like other men. He is giving himself. He is stepping into death. This is a divine act of transition in which he is alive and steps into death voluntarily in his own time according to the Father's will. He completes the work. I want you, if you're not saved, to see this. I want you to see verse 46 as an indication of hope for you. When the Son of God says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, the confidence of that language should communicate to you that this is the one you need to believe in. This is the one who can do all that's necessary to reconcile the sinner to God. If you want to be saved, if you want your sins forgiven, Jesus is the answer. What he accomplishes here on the cross is sufficient for all who will come. It does not matter your background. It does not matter the darkness of your past. It's irrelevant in terms of the question that you may have, can I be saved? The answer to that is explicit, yes. This is the completion of his work, as Luke notes it. The Lord Jesus, having said his last of the seven, seven sayings, gives up the ghost steps into death, lays down his head, as it were. The way you put your head on the pillow tonight, where you step into your bed and you put your head down and you go to sleep, with even more control and even more sovereign power, our Lord laid down his head in death and stepped into it. Thirdly, the declaration. The declaration, verse 47 now, when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Possibly, in conjunction with other supernatural events, it appears that the loudness of the cry of our Lord Jesus was affecting. In Mark's Gospel, Mark 15, 39, Mark records, when the centurion which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost. He said, truly, this man was a son of God. When he saw that he so cried out, when he lets out this loud cry of confidence, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. There was something affecting about that very cry. And it wasn't just affecting to the centurion. In Matthew's account, Matthew 27, 54, Matthew details this. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly this was the Son of God. So that's what I say in conjunction with miraculous events that Matthew records, as well as the cry itself, the cry, the affecting nature of the cry, a culmination of all these miraculous signs and strange things going on, coming to this point where a man raises his voice like this, loudly, in confidence before his God, and then lays down his life. He had never seen anyone crucified like this. Unique in all the deaths he had 
witnessed. And so he becomes convinced. He's been observing it all, possibly and most likely with a sense of dispassion. He's not really all that concerned with what the Jews are bothered about and all the hoopla that surrounds the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a Roman doing his job, a centurion with a task in hand, a responsibility. But it all culminates, it comes to this point, this hardened Roman centurion sees, hears the cry, observes the miracles, and says in Luke's account, certainly this was a righteous man. He becomes intellectually convinced, at the very least intellectually convinced, that Jesus was the Christ. He was the one he claimed to be. He was the one whom he said he was. And this is in contrast with all the claims of the Jews. In other words, he's basically saying publicly, the Jews got it wrong, and we have gotten it wrong. The Jews are wrong in who he is. And we've been wrong to put him to death. This is a righteous man. Was he converted? Doesn't say it specifically, but it would seem, it would seem that he may have been. Is it possible for a man to glorify God in an expression without conversion? Yes. Is it possible for one to give glory to God without feeling the full significance of what it is they're saying? Of course. Church history tends to believe that the centurion was converted. Again, we can't say for sure, but he is certainly influenced, impacted, never to be the same again as far as his experiences of crucifixion. Here, this one who has been mocked and scorned and despised and hated and is a bleeding mess upon the cross. He realizes has been falsely accused. Certainly this was a righteous man. In other words, this man, there is absolutely no foundation to having put this man through what we've done. This is what we do to criminals. This is what we do to sinners. And this man is neither. You have to step back and ask yourself, why does Luke record this? Why give such detail? Is it not showing even a foretaste of what was to follow? The ministry of our Lord Jesus was to the house of Israel. The ministry of his disciples was to the house of Israel. By and large, for the most part, it was a focused ministry to Jews. And here at the point of the climax of our Savior's work, there's indication of interest from Gentiles, of their eyes being opened, a foretaste of what's to follow, an indication of a great sweeping influx of countless millions who will come to the same conclusion. Certainly, this was a righteous man. People who will come from far and near and become convinced that while the whole world is sinful and wicked before God, and there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not, we find one who's distinct, one who is different, one who is righteous. And we believe in him. We believe that he is God's appointed servant, the servant of Jehovah. We believe that he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We believe that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. We believe that this is no ordinary man, this is a righteous man. Whether the centurion understood the full significance of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, I do not know. But these words and this thought 
fill the heart of Gentiles to this very day. Here is the righteous one. Here is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. And our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. This is the one we believe in. This is the one you must turn to. Again, I don't know for sure. Was he saved? I hope so. I trust that we will see him by and by. Fourthly, contrition. Contrition, verse 48. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. All the people that came together to that site. Here's a crowd gathered around. They have been mocking and scorning and sneering and saying things that should not have been said. Despising the Son of God. But they're taking in the things which were done. And here this crowd now comes to a point of contrition. That's what it means to, to smite their breasts. To, they smote their breasts. In Hebrew culture, you smite your breast because you feel a sense of contrition and sorrow. These people are feeling grief and remorse. It's a gesture understood in that day. They're not smiting their breast in some empty fashion. It's reflective of how they're feeling. Perhaps even the testimony of the, the centurion, in addition again to the miraculous events and the, the confident cry of the Lord Jesus and the, the swelling feeling and, and thick atmosphere of something unusual going on, brings a weight upon their souls. They smote their breasts and returned. I think this is very sad, you know. Sometimes when you read in the Old Testament of Jews who smote their breasts, it then moves into their prayer. They smite their breasts. They pluck their hair, the hairs of their beard and so on. Then they begin to cry in prayer to God. The smiting of the breast leads into prayer. That is what it should do. And you go through the Old Testament Scriptures, see it for yourself, the smiting of the breast and prayer. They go hand in hand. But that is not what we see here. There's a smiting of the breast. And then going home. It's not unlike what happens in some gospel services. It's not unlike what happens in some individual lives. Where people can be in a meeting that is deeply moving and they've been under the singing of the great gospel hymns and they can hear the reading of God's word and the preaching of that word and they can be affected by it. They can sit in the ministry. They can feel emotionally moved by it. They can even be brought to a sense of lamentation. They can be drawn to consider that there's something here there's something meaningful. But as they contemplate what the gospel requires of them, instead of stepping from this posture of repentance, this, this expression of deep remorse, and then going into prayer to confess sin, the feeling fades. And they go home, live their lives. If you are here under conviction, if there's a sense of smiting of your breast, a feeling of the sin in your own heart, a comprehension of the weight of your disobedience, if you're feeling even now, at this present hour in your life, you're beginning to question, am I saved? Have my sins be forgiven, been forgiven? Do I know anything of God's saving grace? Have I been born again of the Spirit do I know the power of the blood of Christ? Am I living for the glory of God? Is my life transformed? Do I know God's grace? 
Don't just be moved emotionally. Before you move from the pew tonight, you, you cry out to God. Don't just return home like these people. Cry to God. That's what the publican did, isn't it? The Pharisee goes to the temple, the publican goes to the temple. One prays, delights in all of his own works. I fast twice in the week and so on and so forth. One smites upon his breast and could not so much as lift up his head to heaven but cried, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This man went home justified. Not the religious. The sinner. Smote upon his breast and cried for mercy. Contrition. Finally, impression. Verse 49. And all his acquaintance and the woman that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. Here are the followers of our Lord, at least some of them, a good number of them, all his acquaintance. It's not saying that all who were acquainted with Jesus were there, but all of those who were there who were of his acquaintance, the women for example, and others. They all congregated together. They huddled, being familiar with one another, standing afar off, beholding these things, taking it all in. I believe from John's account, we know that John was there. I think also from Peter's record, being an eyewitness of the sufferings, that Peter, it's a good possibility that language indicates that he turned up at some point and also was there. It may indicate why there's a central focus upon the women and Peter and John when it comes to the resurrection and the details given regarding that. But whoever they are, some of the names we are given in other gospel accounts, they stand afar off. They just step back and they take in everything that's going on, beholding these things. It had to have made an impression. Beholding these things. The significance of those words must be understood beholding these things these people once our Lord rises from the dead these people are going to have their lives governed by what they beheld that day yes they were saddened they thought the Messiah was dead not in victory but in tragedy When our Lord rises from the dead, he puts that to rest. But what an impression. Beholding these things. That's a good way to end the cross, isn't it? In one sense, you might say, Luke is now saying to Theophilus, the one receiving his writing, and to all who would read it in the years to come, it's like stopping and saying, go you back up and behold these things. Return to what I have recorded and behold these things. Don't let the language and the details I have given wash over you like some once upon a time story. Go and behold these things. Beloved, this is how we live our lives. Every day there should be a beholding of these things. 
How can you rightly motivate your heart tomorrow morning? Fall on your knees. Meditate on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ponder what he became, what he accomplished. Feel the glory and muse on the justice of God, the holiness of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, and the love of God on display as you behold these things at the cross. There's no scene in all of human history that so puts before our view the nature of our God. What can compare when trying to understand what is good to consider God giving a son and doing what is good Since he has made sin for us, it is the right thing. It is the good thing then for him to take the value of that. Let sinners go free. It is just. It is merciful. It is loving. Oh, that we would behold these things every day. That your life and mine would be governed by the cross. That you might say with Paul, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you would go from this place and you would preach the cross. That you and your despair and the sorrows of life would preach the cross to your own soul. And as you interact with lost sinners and people without Christ, that you wouldn't enter into argument of philosophical nature, but you simply preach the cross. There is a power, a power to putting forth before the vision of men an explanation of God's activity on behalf of sinners and sending a son to be the savior of the world, to be made sin for us, to go to that cross and die in our place that we might go free. Children, do you believe? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are your sins forgiven? Do you see the significance of Jesus dying on the cross? Please, please, boys and girls, listen. Please do not allow yourself simply to think of the cross as something that happened in the past. It did happen in history. But make sure you see what happened there as something that is for you. You're to see God's answer for you as a sinner. The death of Jesus so that you need not perish. May God save you and all who are here. Let's bow together in prayer. Here's the moment. Here's the moment where you may smite upon your breast and then just return home the way you've done before. And I'm calling upon you in these minutes 
to cry out to God to save your soul. Come. Come on to me, Jesus says. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. There's forgiveness for you. And pardon, freely offered. Seek it. And if you need help from me, let me know. Lord, bless thy word. Help us to cherish the old rugged cross. Help us to love the bleeding Lamb of Calvary. And behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Precious Lamb of God, help us to see Thee. Help us to love Thee. May we always do the work of the evangelist, preaching to men and women the power of the cross. And may you save souls. Even here tonight, please, Lord, let no one return home unsaved. Thank you for this day, for your presence in our midst, and for the comfort and instruction of thy word. Give the power of the Holy Ghost to the church now as she steps out of these doors and into the world. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with all the people of God now and evermore. Amen.